But this is the time of year we think about resolutions, right? Where, you know, New Year's is, is right around the corner. And as we think about setting some goals, I really want to encourage you to consider setting some spiritual goals. And uh, I hope that you would take into consideration spiritual goals that would help you fall more in love with Jesus. And it really is my heart's desire today that this message and the scriptures that we're going to look at would hope... Uh, turn your hearts towards loving Jesus more. If you're just kind of picking up with this, we're in a series called The Thread, and we're in the Old Testament. It's kind of the first half of the Bible, second half of the Bible is the New Testament. And uh, uh, the Old Testament kind of whispers Jesus' name all throughout it. We're actually going to be in the book of Jeremiah today. Jeremiah chapter 31 is our key text, even though we're going to look at some other passages. But what you'll find through this study that we started back in August is that the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. And it's amazing how God has kind of woven the story together. And what I want to do uh, to start out with, I just want to give you a simple way to understand the scriptures and hopefully tie this idea of the thread together maybe a little tighter than it has been for you this fall semester. So if you want to be a student of the Bible, or if you are a student of the Bible, then Genesis chapter 12 should be a key text for you. Uh, In Genesis 1 through 11, God really begins to give revelation to the entire world, but it's in chapter 12 where God begins to pluck a pagan Arab out of the Iraqi region. Now, in the biblical times, that was known as Mesopotamia, and God says to this Arab, I'm going to show you who I am, and I'm going to do something great through you, and I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others, and through your seed, I'm going to bless every nation on earth. You say, what in the world was God doing with that? What God was doing is he wanted to illustrate who he was through relationship. And he does it with a man named Abraham. Now, it wasn't because Abraham's descendants were better than anyone else. It's just because God wanted to show that there is one God who is creator of heaven and earth, and you can't know him unless he gets down to show us who he is, unless he reveals himself to us. So on the screen, Genesis 12 is going to be shown, and I want to read it with you, just the first three verses. The Bible says this, then God said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, God gives a couple of promises in that covenant. And the first promise is land. He was going to give him land. He was going to make him a great nation. He says, I'm going to bless you. And then he gives another promise is you're going to have a lot of kids. There's going to be descendants after descendants, and they will be a blessing. They will be a blessing to everyone around you. This is known as the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, so just in your minds, think of the first piece is this Abrahamic covenant. It's essential to understanding the entire scriptures because it's the story of God fulfilling his unconditional promise to Abraham. And it's played out. Even where we are in Jeremiah today is connected to the Abrahamic covenant. And what's amazing is in the covenant, there were two parties that were making uh, something stronger than a contract. But Abraham, when it came to this covenant, did nothing. God was the initiator. In Genesis 15, it's actually my favorite section of Scripture out of all the Old Testament. It's Genesis 15. It's really weird. If you were to read it, it's really messed up. Now, here's even an additional piece to the weirdness. This is one of my favorite texts to use in weddings. And I know what you're thinking, like, what in the world? No joke. The last wedding I did, the couple looked at me because there's this weird part where they cut animals in halves, and the groom-to-be looked at me and he goes, you're not going to talk about the blood, are you? And I'm like, no, 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 man, I'll talk. I'll, it'll be, I'll be more general than that. But this idea of covenant is absolutely beautiful in Genesis 15. The crazy part is Abraham's asleep. God does all of the work, and it was a one-way covenant. God didn't require anything of Abraham other than to have God share this moment with him. And God said, I'm going to be good on this covenant. Not long after that, 
the descendants of Abraham are enslaved in a place known as Egypt. And God raises up a prophet named Moses. And he says, uh, Moses says, it's time for me to tell you a little bit more about this God that we've been discussing. He's holy. He's pure. He's righteous. And as you live your lives, you should not be insincere with him at all. Because you're not going to get what God promised to Abraham before us unless you do what's right. So in Deuteronomy 28, we're introduced to what is known as the Mosaic Covenant. So you have the Abrahamic Covenant. It is unconditional. And then we enter into the Mosaic Covenant. Some, of, some people call this the Palestinian Land Covenant. And you'll read about it in chapter 28 and chapter 29 of Deuteronomy. And what you find there is it says, if you do right, I will bless you. But if you do wrong... It will cost you. And then we get to Deuteronomy chapter 30 where God kind of sums all this up. He has already unconditionally promised that he will bless Israel and that all nations would be blessed through them. But then in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, here's what God's word says. It says, see today I've set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. For I'm commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commands, statutes, and ordinances so that you may live and multiply and the Lord your God may bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not listen and you are led astray to bow and worship to other gods and serve them, I tell you today that you will certainly perish and will not prolong the days in the land you are entering to possess across the Jordan. Remember, in the Abrahamic covenant, God had promised land, and he said, that's all good and right as long as you obey. But if you don't, you're gonna perish, you're not gonna inherit the land. You say, what is up with that? How in the world did God make an unconditional promise in the Abrahamic covenant? But now we get to the Mosaic covenant, and all of a sudden there's conditions. How does this happen? God essentially puts conditions on unconditional love. How does that work? How does that fit together? Now, I just want to make a side note here. This is how most people, right? If you don't understand the overarching themes of Scripture, this is how most people read the Old Testament God. They see him as, if you do right, I will bless you. If you do wrong, I will kill you or punish you or on and on. And if you don't have that connected to the Abrahamic covenant or if you don't connect it to the covenant we're about to read about in a moment, what you're left with is a very angry, selfish God. And a lot of people walk away with that impression of the Old Testament of an angry, selfish God. But I just wanna caution you to hold on for just a moment because as we push a little further, we're gonna see there's another covenant. In 2 Samuel chapter seven, this is called the Davidic covenant, right? So you have covenant with Abraham, covenant with Moses, and now covenant with David. And this is where God tells David that he's gonna do something great. So look with me in 2 Samuel chapter seven, verse 12. The Bible says, when your times come and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with the rod of men and blows from mortals. But my faithful love will never leave him as it did when I removed it from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. God says to David, a descendant is gonna come from you and he is going to reign forever. He puts no condition on it. So think about this. The Abrahamic covenant, unconditional. The Mosaic covenant, conditional. The Davidic covenant, unconditional. Someone's coming from David's line that will reign forever. And then we get to the prophets. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel. All three of them talk about a new covenant. And God says through them, I wanna show you that when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. You can always bank on my promises. I will always be good on my word. God comes along and he says, I'm gonna tell you there's a, there's a day coming where this really will happen. There is someone who's going to be a descendant of David, who is a descendant of Abraham, and they will reign forever. And the way that I'm going to accomplish this, I'm going to do something great. I'm going to cut a new covenant. 
that will allow me to be reconciled to you. And that's what we find in Ezekiel uh, 36, in Joel chapter 2, and then Jeremiah 31. That is our key text for today. Read with me in verse 31 of Jeremiah 31. It says, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand. And that reference to took them by the hand is a reference to the conditional Mosaic covenant. He said, I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, right? They broke the the conditional covenant where God said, you need to obey me and I will bless you. If you disobey me, you will be punished. They broke the covenant. Even though I am their master, the Lord's declaration, verse 33 says, instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord for they will all know me. From the least to the greatest of them, this is the Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. God says, behold, the days are coming. That was his declaration. As Jeremiah is actually writing these words down, Israel was at a point where they um, were coming to the end of disobeying the Mosaic law. God was kind of fed up with it. He was getting ready really kind of to give them a good spiritual whooping and he was gonna send them to, into exile and out of the land that he had promised them. They were gonna be oppressed by a guy named King Nebuchadnezzar and by Babylon and the north was gonna be oppressed by the Assyrians. But before he ever sends them out of their land, he says, behold, days are coming when I will make a new covenant with you. So again, you have the Abrahamic covenant, unconditional. You have the Mosaic covenant, conditional. The Davidic covenant, unconditional. And God's saying here, guess what? I'm making a new covenant. You have broken the covenants of old, but I'm gonna be good on my word. I'm gonna do something that is going to allow me to forgive you, and it's going to allow me to be just and faithful all at the same time. Let me ask you, how can God give people an intimate relationship with him when the condition is for that relationship to happen, they must obey his laws perfectly. How can that happen? The answer is this. God says, I'm gonna give somebody that will meet the conditions and he was going to be the means through which God would both be just and the justifiers of those who love him. Are you tracking with me? Does that covenantal history make sense? Well, I wanna show you another thread that's happening in this text. It's actually in Jeremiah 31, just before Jeremiah says, hey, there's a new covenant coming. We've blown the old covenant so many times. God's promising a new covenant. But before he talks about the new covenant, there's this thread that God's weaving together before. Look up in verse 15, Jeremiah 31. Verse 15 says this, this is what the Lord says. A voice was heard in Ramah, a lament with bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. This is what the Lord says, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for the reward for your work will come. This is the Lord's declaration. And your children will return from the enemy's land. They were in exile, right? He's talking about bringing them home. There is hope for your future. This is the Lord's declaration. The tears of Rachel, why in the world would Jeremiah use this reference to the tears of Rachel before he sets up this announcement of the new covenant? Rachel's tears are only mentioned three times in all the scriptures. The first time they're mentioned is in Genesis chapter 35. Guess where Jacob and and Rachel were coming from? They were coming from being exiled. And they were on their way home. But there was a great tragedy along the way in a town called Ramah. Rachel was pregnant, and in the town of Ramah, she stopped to give birth. 
And as she gave birth, she looked at her son and she knew in the process of giving birth that she was dying. And she looked at her son and she named him and she wept, the Bible tells us, and then she passed away. The second time we hear about Rachel's tears is right here in this passage in Jeremiah chapter 31. What happens at the city of Ramah? In the process of the Israelites being exiled, the Babylonians have come in, they've totally destroyed Jerusalem, they've killed people along the way, and they were taking prisoners outside of the city of Jerusalem. And guess where they took them? They took them to the city of Ramah. Ramah was a place that was like a staging station. It was a transit campground. It was a camp where prisoners who were going to be taken away would be gathered and kind of uh, uh, systematized, leaving uh, Ramah. And you can imagine in this moment the tears of the mothers who couldn't find their kids in the midst of the shuffle of the Babylonians sweeping them out of the city. They lost their kids, and so the tears of the mothers would flow. You can only imagine the kids that would die in the process of being sent into exile. And Rachel's tears here are the expression of her lost descendants. Figuratively, she is weeping for their suffering. But then there's a third time that Rachel's tears are mentioned. And it's in Matthew chapter 2 in the New Testament, where the New Testament is being uh, revealing of the Old Testament And when Matthew quotes the passage, he actually quotes Jeremiah chapter 31 that we just read. And when he says it, when he quotes it, what he says is, Jesus will fulfill this. Now, why did Jeremiah use Rachel's tears as the foundation for talking about the new covenant? It's because God promised that Rachel's children, her descendants, would be brought back from exile and they would be brought back home and that's exactly what happened. Physically speaking, her descendants were sent out and they were brought back in. God was good on his word, but there's also a spiritual element to this. Jesus was the fulfillment of Rachel's tears. She was weeping for her lost children in the exact same way that God weeps for those who are far from him. How did Jesus fulfill this? It's mentioned in Matthew chapter two. If you're familiar with the story of Jesus' birth, there were some wise men who were coming to worship him. They saw the star and they were coming with their gifts. They wanted to worship uh, the Savior and they stopped with this king named Herod and Herod finds out what in the world this king and he begins to put out a decree that he's killing all two-year-old baby boys in the land because he wanted to protect his throne. In the process, Jesus' parents flee in exile to the land of Egypt. You know, if you kind of look at all of Jesus' career, if Jesus' life, that is very fitting because Jesus always seemed to be in exile. At one point, Jesus even says, foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Jesus, most of the time, had no place to go. He was a homeless wanderer. But then at the end of his life, Jesus is moving in towards the town of Jerusalem. And in Luke 19, it says, when he saw Jerusalem, he wept over it. When Matthew talks about this moment, he says, when he wept, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wish I could take you under my wing. That's the language of a parent. The the picture we have here is, is of Jesus Christ weeping like a parent for their child weeping deliberately. He's the ultimate Rachel, Jesus is. And in the process of Jesus' death, just like Rachel died so that her son Benjamin could have life, Jesus died so that we could have life. He is the ultimate Rachel. When he gets to the cross in Hebrews chapter 13, it points out the fact that the cross was outside of the gate. It was outside of the city. Jesus, when he goes to the cross, is cast out. He went into the ultimate exile. The Father cast him out so that we could be brought in. This is the new covenant. He took the penalty that we deserve. We actually deserve, spiritually speaking, to be sent into spiritual exile 
But the promise that God had throughout the covenants is that his people would be brought home, not just physically, but in close relationship. The same kind of relationship that God was establishing and showing when he started the first covenant with Abraham, that he was gonna be a good, close, personal God. That is the image that we have here in him taking the penalty for us. He is the reason we can be brought into fellowship with God. This new covenant that Jeremiah talks about fulfills the Abrahamic covenant through the person of Jesus Christ, who's also called the son of David, which fulfills all the conditions of the Mosaic covenant, which had conditions applied to it. This is why Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. Jesus claims I've met every condition the law demands. But here's what's interesting about Christ taking our penalty is that when Jesus was meeting the conditions of the law, he paid the penalty of a lawbreaker, even though he had never broken the law. But for us, it means that we now have no debt towards sin and death. And those who do have an obligation to sin and death, which would be all of us who have been spiritually exiled, all of us who have offended God, all of us who have broken the commands of God, that would be us. We have an obligation to sin and death. Those of us who are spiritually broken can go to the one who paid the debt. He did not owe it, but he paid it so that we might be forgiven, so that we can be reconciled to him. God did what they couldn't do to meet the conditions And so that they could be unconditionally blessed. God did all of that for them. All the while, God was showing himself to be holy, to be just, but at the same time, to be merciful and kind. You see what's happening here in the thread? We couldn't meet the conditions of a holy God. He knew when he set up the Mosaic Covenant, they couldn't meet the demands. When God makes the one-on-one covenant with Abraham at the beginning, but doesn't require Abraham to pass through the parts which would have made the covenant official, God actually went through. He never made, never made Abraham pass through the parts. Essentially what God's saying there is, Abraham, guess what? I know you can't meet the demands of the covenant. You can't even hold up your end, so guess what? I'm gonna do it for you. God begins to whisper the new covenant all the way back at the Abrahamic covenant. But we can't meet the demands of a holy God. There's no one in the room good enough. There's no one watching online good enough where God would go, hey, you are my boy and you are my girl. He can't say that straight up unless the righteous, uh, the righteous requirement had been paid for. None of us are good enough. He says, hey, I'm a holy father. I'm nothing like you. My demands are great. And so that causes us who are spiritually exiled, it causes us to be under judgment. But God says, because I love you, And because I can't just kind of wink at sin and go, yeah, come on in and enjoy heaven with me. I I can't do that. God says, no, I can't do that. So instead, I'm going to meet the conditions of holiness. And I'm going to send my own eternal son. And there's going to be an eternally perfect sacrifice, which will be given for me that I might be satisfied and that you might be forgiven. That is the beautiful picture we have of the thread, weaving its way from the Abrahamic covenant through the Mosaic covenant into the Davidic covenant into the new covenant where God says, I'm making a covenant unlike any other because you can't meet the demands, but I can. You say, well, what does that mean for us? Well, are you here today and struggling with loneliness? Bible says in Deuteronomy 31, he will never leave you or forsake you because he is a close personal God Are you struggling to provide for your family? Philippians 4 says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in the glory of Christ Jesus. Are you in some type of emotional or spiritual fight or struggle? Exodus 14 says, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Are you struggling with clarity and direction in your life? Proverbs 3 says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Are you tired and exhausted? Matthew 11 says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. But maybe you're here today, and maybe you understand, hey, I I think I've violated God. I think I've done some things God wouldn't choose or have me to do, and I've done them. 
and I've offended him and I have a broken relationship with God, I'm saying you can be reconciled today. You can actually have a close personal relationship with God where you no longer owe the debt to sin and spiritual death because Jesus came and he is the new covenant. And the only thing it requires of you is acknowledging the fact that you are far from God, but that you need him. And that you acknowledge that he laid his life down for you, was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. That he paid the penalty for you. And I would encourage you, if you've never done that, to trust in Christ today. It's not just that you could have a new 2019, but it's because this is true. Your eternity will pivot on what you do with Jesus. And I hope for all of us, even if you claim to be a Christ follower, I hope for all of us today that you will commit in the new year to figure out how to love Jesus more.